When people think of earthquakes and where they occur in the United States, the popular references that come to mind are often associated with the West Coast, San Francisco specifically. People have heard about the great 1906 earthquake and of course the World Series earthquake of 1989, both of which occurred on the San Andreas Fault, where the Pacific Tectonic Plate and North American Plate meet. Then, off the coast of the Great Northwest, there's the well-known Cascadia Subduction Zone, a long sloping fault that separates the Juan de Fuca and North American plates, and has a length which spans from British Columbia, Canada, all the way down to Northern California. The last time the Cascadia Subduction Zone released an earthquake in 1700, its monumental impact was felt all the way across the Pacific Ocean, making its mark on Japanese history. Now, both of the fault zones just mentioned, the San Andreas and the Cascadia, happen to be where plate boundaries meet. That is, where the edge of one tectonic plate meets the edge of another. The dominant earthquake theory today uses the interaction of these plates to explain how earthquakes are triggered. Therefore, not to our surprise, many of the most well-known earthquakes that have been documented in modern history occurred atop plate boundaries. The recent magnitude 9.0 March 11th earthquake in Japan, for example, took place on a subduction zone of the Pacific Plate. The famous 2004 Sumatra earthquake and tsunami, as well, occurred where two plates meet. As for the devastation brought about by these disasters, the Japan and Sumatra earthquake and tsunamis took with them over 20,000 and over a quarter million lives, respectively. But if you look at a map that marks all the known plate boundaries that exist on our planet, you'll quickly learn that even those lives lost on March 11th in 2004 account for only a tiny fraction of all of humanity's loss in the past as a result of earthquakes. And if we don't act to prepare and prevent them for the future, we can keep counting. But if you think the devastation is limited to the plate boundaries, Think again. There are many earthquakes that the current theory of plate tectonics simply cannot fully account for. Like, for example, earthquakes that occur not at the boundary, but in the interior of a tectonic plate. Therefore, let us come back to the United States and move eastward from California and Washington State to western Tennessee, where, sitting beneath the heartland of America, is the sleeping giant the New Madrid Seismic Zone. On the 16th of December, 1811, about 2 a.m. we were visited by a violent shock of an earthquake, accompanied by a very awful noise resembling loud but distant thunder, but more hoarse and vibrating, which was followed in a few minutes by the complete saturation of the atmosphere with sulfurous vapor, causing total darkness. The screams of the affrighted inhabitants running to and fro, not knowing where to go or what to do. The cries of the fowls and beasts of every species. The cracking of the trees falling and the roaring of the Mississippi River 
the current of which was retrograde for a few minutes, formed a scene truly horrible. It was dangerous for people to stay in their dwellings, for fear these dwellings might collapse and bury them in their ruins. It was dangerous to be out in the open air, for large trees would be breaking off their tops by the violence of the shocks and continually falling to the earth, or the earth itself opening in dark, yawning chasms or fissures and belching forth muddy water, large lumps of blue clay, coal, and sand. And when the violence of the shocks were over, moaned and slept, again gathering power for a more violent commotion. The earth in these explosions would open in fissures from 600 to 1300 feet in length and from three and five feet in width. Their depth, none knew, as no one had strength of nerve sufficient to fathom them. At about 10 o'clock in the night, I was awakened by a most tremendous noise accompanied by an agitation of the boat so violent that it appeared in danger of upsetting. I ran to the door of our cabin, where I could distinctly see the river as if agitated by a storm. And although the noise was inconceivably loud and terrific, I could distinctly hear the crash of falling trees and the screaming of the wild fowl on the river. On the 8th of February, 1812, the day on which the severest shocks took place, the shocks seemed to go in waves like waves of the sea, throwing down brick chimneys level with the ground. A family of the name of Koran were moving from New Madrid to an old French town on the Arkansas River, called the Port, had passed the St. Francis swamps and found some of their cattle missing. Leroy, the youngest son, took an Indian pony, rode back to hunt them, and was in the swamp when the first shock took place was never seen afterwards, and was supposed to have been lost in some of these fearful chasms. When you consider the threats posed to the south-central United States, you think of tornadoes, you think of floods. By conventional theory, major earthquakes seem to be the farthest thing fathomable for this region lying in the middle of the United States, being nowhere near any tectonic borders. But it is scenarios like the New Madrid Seismic Zone, which goes to show the truth behind the saying, what you don't know can kill you. The sequence of earthquakes that erupted in New Madrid through the winter months of 1811 to 1812 began with a pair of very large earthquakes on December 16, 1811, estimated to be anywhere between magnitude 7.2 and 8.1. More earthquakes of equal magnitude and aftershocks were to follow. Some estimates indicate that the earthquakes were felt strongly over the immediate 50,000 square miles of the epicenters, and moderately across nearly 1 million square miles. Shock waves managed to penetrate through the Midwestern bedrock, as residents all the way in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania were awakened by the intense shaking, and sidewalks were reported to have cracked in Washington, D.C. Even church bells were said to have rung as far as Boston and present-day Toronto, making the New Madrid earthquakes among the most powerful ever to hit the United States. In fact, by some estimates, these earthquakes may have been the most powerful succession of seismic upheavals in the same place in the shortest span of time experienced by humans in modern times. Today, if a repeat of the events were to occur, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, effects similar to those of the 1811-1812 earthquakes could be expected. Earthquake hazards generally, and especially in the New Madrid, involve more than just horizontal ground shaking. The historic New Madrid earthquakes caused landslides along the Mississippi River Bluffs from Mississippi to Kentucky, as well as lateral spreading and ground subsidence caused by a soil liquefaction that affected close to 6,000 square miles across the Mississippi River floodplain and along its tributaries. In a recurrence of the earthquakes today, the immediate surrounding states of Arkansas, Alabama, Missouri, Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, Mississippi, and Indiana are expected to suffer the same effects, if not worse. However, the damage inflicted by the New Madrid earthquakes 200 years ago is simply incommensurable when compared to the quantity and quality of damage that will be felt by the much more population-dense region 
of the central Mississippi River Valley today. 200 years ago, much of the region was just being settled. The Louisiana Purchase, which comprises the western half of the territory in immediate danger of the new Madrid earthquakes, had just been made less than 10 years prior. Simply said, the same earthquake effects of 200 years ago will result in unique and magnified economic and humanitarian destruction today especially in light of over four decades of deliberate neglect and takedown of our nation's infrastructure, culminating today in President Obama's continued assault on the general welfare in the name of bailing out Wall Street and London's gambling debts. Take the region's aging roads and bridges, for example. Whereas earthquake-caused fissures on dirt roads created impassable obstacles for the region's inhabitants in 1812, forcing evacuees to tread through waist-deep swamp water to escape danger. Similar fissures can significantly disrupt or even destroy today's network of roadways. That, combined with bridge failures, may create an impossibility for emergency evacuation. Consider, for example, the possibility of Interstate 55, a main highway artery that runs through the new Madrid seismic zone, getting cut off by fissures. Take into account also the impact on food production, the heart of the economy of the South Central United States. The venting of large quantities of water, sand, and mud, like what was witnessed by the survivors of the 1811-1812 earthquakes, could flood fields and farmland, both destroying crops and soil. Meanwhile, considering the intricate network of water infrastructure, like the TVA, involved in making the Mississippi and surrounding river systems navigable and indispensable for commerce, earthquake-induced failures of levees, dams, and other water control mechanisms would not only contribute to severe flooding, but also make the Mississippi and its tributaries inaccessible for an indefinite period of time, severely stifling human and food transport. A 2009 report funded by FEMA on the impact of new Madrid seismic zone earthquakes on the central United States, found that a magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake would be catastrophic for the eight-state region mentioned earlier. The team of specialists foresee nearly 715,000 buildings and 130 hospitals damaged, 3,500 bridges impaired, and nearly 425,000 breaks and leaks to both state and local pipelines. Roughly 15 major bridges are unusable and the huge travel delays in Memphis and St. Louis hinders search and rescue, as well as evacuation. 2.6 million people are expected to be without power after the quake, and three days later, 7.2 million people are still displaced. But most important are the lives in immediate danger of an earthquake. Memphis, St. Louis, Little Rock, as well as numerous other small and medium-sized cities where there are high concentrations of people would be devastated. The same FEMA-sponsored report forecasts at least 86,000 injuries and fatalities resulting from structural building and bridge damage alone, not including those related to transportation accidents, fires, or hazardous materials exposure. The city of Memphis, for example, and its surrounding metropolitan area is home to more than a million people and likely to be the focus of the worst damage in the area. Unfortunately, however, just like the rest of the country, Memphis is severely underprepared for an earthquake. Add to this the fact that among the city's aging infrastructure are many large public buildings like schools and fire stations that have never been reinforced and therefore very vulnerable to ground shaking. And since the last major earthquakes in the region happened 200 years ago, most buildings have been built without using any earthquake building codes. Meanwhile, in downtown Memphis, soil liquefaction and related ground failures are likely to occur along the Mississippi River and along the Wolf River that passes through the city. Pipelines running under the Wolf River could be ruptured. Old highways and bridges that cross these rivers would likely be damaged or collapse altogether. The New Madrid Seismic Zone might appear to have been of a more subtle nature since the events of 1811 and 1812. The naive may even conclude that because of a lack of measurable strain at the surface, that there is no buildup of stress in the depths of the seismic zone, and therefore it no longer poses a threat. But just how much do we know about the causes of intraplate earthquakes, 
typified by the new magic seismic zone, or causes of earthquakes in general. When the ruling high priests of earthquake science, like Robert Geller, say you can't forecast earthquakes altogether. Or when you have a sitting president who's making a priority of shutting down and canceling satellites and observational systems, which are indispensable in earthquake and weather forecasting. In a recently published commentary in Nature Geoscience, a pair of scientists, Philip England of Oxford University and James Jackson of Cambridge University, shifts our attention to the threats posed by unanticipated quakes located in the continental interiors. They warn, death rates in earthquakes within continental interiors have often exceeded 5% and can be as high as 30%. According to their data, over the past 120 years, there have been about 130 earthquakes around the world where a thousand people or more have died. Of these, 30 occurred at plate boundaries, causing 800,000 deaths, roughly half of that by tsunamis, whereas about 100 occurred in continental interiors, causing 1.4 million deaths in total. Excluding deaths by tsunamis, inland quakes have proven to be the most deadly. The main reason for these high tolls, Jackson and England stressed, is perhaps mainly due to how little we know about these inland earthquake zones. The paradox of the new magic seismic zone has not been lost on present-day geologists and seismologists. To explain the anomalous seismicity, scientists have invoked the hypothesis that around 750 million years ago, the continental crust of the present-day United States began to pull itself apart in a process like that which created the Atlantic Ocean Basin. For some reason, this attempt to create an ocean basin failed leaving only a failed rift, covered by a sedimentary basin over which the Mississippi River flows today, and a number of faults in the weakened crust beneath, which for some reason are periodically activated, perhaps by the pressure from distant plates. Direct geological evidence, like sand blows that form when underground sand and water erupted to the surface as a result of violent shaking, shows a record of major earthquakes in the New Madrid seismic zone occurring periodically over the past 4,500 years. In addition to the quakes in 1811 to 1812, large widespread sand blows were found indicating previous large earthquakes around AD 1450, 8900, and 2350 BC. The puzzle of this earthquake prone area and other intraplate seismic zones like it across the world, far from plate boundaries, could be an opportunity for major new geological discoveries that go beyond the current theory of plate tectonics, which is supposed to be all-encompassing, but is based on very little direct observational evidence. It is likely that there are various causes for various phenomena that are now classed generically as earthquakes. In fact, there was an alternative theory for earthquake generation in places like New Madrid, put forth in the 1990s by Thomas Gold in his book, The Deep Hot Biosphere. Gold had developed the theory that hydrocarbons are continually upwelling from the mantle, deep beneath the crust. These extremely high pressure gases penetrate the pore spaces of rocks in the crust and often surface through violent processes, such as volcanoes. But under certain conditions, these same gases could fracture rock on their upward journey to the point of causing earthquakes. This might help to explain the frequent first-person accounts of violent gaseous emissions accompanying earthquakes, as we saw in the case of the 1811-1812 New Madrid earthquakes. It would also vindicate the views of many of the ancients, whose accounts testify to their belief that earthquakes were caused by great winds from below. It is the case that gaseous emission is considered a common earthquake precursor especially the emission of radon. Radon is present throughout the crust as a byproduct of natural radioactive decay and is carried to the surface in the presence of lighter gases, such as methane, which Thomas Gold hypothesized were continually upwelling from far below. Several studies have shown anomalous atmospheric heating, as well as electrical disturbances in the ionosphere 
above earthquake epicenters in the days before the earthquakes hit. These precursor signals have been attributed by some to the action of radon gas. According to this theory, the ionization of the atmosphere by radioactive radon changes its electrical conductivity and also helps to initiate water vapor condensation, which releases latent heat to the atmosphere. In this complex interaction involving the lithosphere, atmosphere, and ionosphere, the radon release is typically seen as an effect of the shifting crust as it builds towards an earthquake. But if Gold's theory is true, there may be cases where the gas itself may be part of the cause of crustal movement. Given the magnitude of the threats posed by what are still considered somewhat mysterious forces of nature, such questions of fundamental scientific research must now become matters of national policy. In a healthy society, one that takes long-term survival seriously, every possible scientific frontier which serves to further our knowledge of the universe we live in should naturally be a national priority. There are some things that we can't control. We can't control earthquakes, we can't control tsunamis, we can't control uprisings on the other side of the world. However, the course of events playing out in our very own United States under President Barack Obama is forcing Americans to accept a premature death. In light of our entrance into a heightened period of seismic, solar, and galactic activity, and especially in light of the record storms in the South and Central United States, which are destroying lives as well as our nation's food supply, Obama is found deliberately shutting down crucial agencies and monitoring systems which are indispensable for forecasting earthquakes, storms, and like phenomena. Since his ascension to the presidency, we witnessed the defunding of NASA's critical Earth monitoring satellites, the Army Corps of Engineers, the National Weather Service, and the shutdown of manned spaceflight. Policies coherent with this Nazi T4 healthcare and bailouts at the expense of the American people. The office of the United States President is reserved as an institution whose first and only priority is to defend and promote the people's general welfare. And when you have a president whose allegiance is obviously to an enemy and whose motive is to kill the population, he needs to be removed and replaced promptly. If so, the scientific challenges posed to us, like an earthquake in the New Madrid, can begin to be solved. The government agencies are there. They simply need to have their full funding and respect restored. Our extrasensory satellites and related systems for weather and earthquake forecasting can be dramatically improved in cooperation with an international scientific community. Emergency responders from the police and firefighters to the Army Corps of Engineers can be revamped to be prepared in the event of a disaster upon its forecast. There's a lot that can happen immediately. As a matter of fact, all of this could have happened yesterday. With the reenactment of the Glass-Steagall Act, it can happen tomorrow. The survival of present and future mankind depends on us making this policy shift.